My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity FM, the place where we interview the future. If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in two ways. Number one is you can uh, write a brief review on iTunes, or number two is you can simply go to interviewthefuture.com and simply make a donation. Today, my guest on the show for the second time would be Professor Gary Marcus. Gary is a professor of psychology at NYU uh, and the author of a number of books on neuroscience, psychology, and learning. Gary was also the founder and the CEO of a company called Geometric Intelligence, which was a machine learning company acquired by Uber in 2016. And if I remember correctly, he had a short stint as the head of AI for Uber. I, I was the director of Uber AI Labs. Fantastic. So um, maybe we'll touch very briefly on that. But the reason why we are here today with Gary is his most recent book, which I just finished reading and really enjoyed very much and highly would recommend. I think it will be a healthy dose of realism for our singularitarian, transhumanist and general AI community. And the book is called Rebooting AI, Building Artificial Intelligence We Can Trust. So without further ado, Welcome to Singularity FM, Gary. No, thanks for having me back. I love the first interview we did. It has a special place in my heart because it was the first time I talked at length about AI anywhere, and it was a great interview. So it's interesting to think how things have changed since 2012 and how they haven't changed. Fantastic. And, and that's exactly right. I myself learned a lot from our first interview, to be honest with you. Um, and that was in 2012. So that was almost seven years ago. Um, and there's a lot of things that have changed and a lot of things that perhaps haven't changed. And we're going to talk about that. But let's start with something more basic. For those of our viewers and listeners who may not seen, may not have seen the first interview, who is Gary Marcus? How would you introduce yourself in a couple of sentences? Uh, well, I'll add one thing that you didn't mention, which is I'm now um, the CEO and founder, a co-founder of a company called Robust.ai, which just started. Um, and I'm actually Professor Emeritus at NYU. So I've, I've just started a life transition. Um, I've, I've wrapped up my academic career. I'm pretty young to be an Emeritus. Um, but I wow. am now uh, living on the West Coast and, and running a robotics company with Rodney Brooks and other people. Um, wow, that, that's phenomenal. I, I was not aware that you have become a Professor Emeritus. I am aware of Robust AI, and it's on the list of questions that I have for you today. So... Those are the titles, but who is Gary Marcus? If you meet somebody in a bar and they ask you, okay, Gary, who are you? What do you do? Then what do you tell them? Well, first and foremost, I'd say I'm a cognitive scientist. I'm interested in the human mind. I'm interested in how natural intelligence works. And for the last several years, as you know, I've also been interested in artificial intelligence, what natural intelligence can tell us about artificial intelligence. I guess beyond that, I would say I'm unafraid of being a contrarian and um you know I, i'm not deliberately a contrarian but i i feel comfortable speaking out uh in, in the light of controversy and um and so you know i'm i'm known for that as well yeah actually speaking about that the first interview that we did uh, in 2012 which i suggest people go and check out because there's a there's a lot of prescient things that we discussed at, at that time was after I read an article by you, I think it was in the New York in the New Yorker, uh, talking about Ray Kurzweil's dubious theory of mind. And I think for the past six or seven years, uh, a lot of the things that have met you mentioned there have kind of shown themselves to be either completely true or to be indeed obstacles towards accomplishing artificial general intelligence. Uh, so I highly recommend the article too. But let's, okay, let's, let's get on the topic here. It's been seven years. What were the biggest things that did happen and didn't happen in the field of AI for that much time? The most surprising thing that happened since 2012 was probably DeepMind's victory in Go. Everybody figured computers would win in Go eventually. But if you'd asked me in 2012, I would have said maybe 2025 or something like that. And they did it, I guess, in 2015 or 16. So they went way ahead of what people were expecting. And they did that with the combination of 
really impressive engineering chops and a massive amount of data, a massive amount of compute. And I think more largely, the, the big thing that has changed is that the quantity of compute that people throw at problems now is just unbelievable. It was unimaginable in 2012. Um, that said, I don't think it was a major advance towards general artificial intelligence. And I don't think I've seen anything <coughs> that's a convincing advance towards artificial general intelligence in 2012. So I was worried in 2012 in that critique of Ray Kurzweil and also in a piece I wrote around the same time, a critique of deep learning also for The New Yorker. I said, you know, this is one tool among many. It's really, you know, it's very interesting, but it's not going to solve the problems of causal understanding of natural language understanding and so forth. And I think that those problems still remain very much open. So the difference between Go and the real world is immense. So in Go, you know, the rules haven't changed in 2000 years. Um, there's only so many things you can do at the board at any one time. It's a very closed system. And with all of that brute force computation, it's not literally brute force in the classic sense, but you can still think of it that way. With, with all that brute force computation, you can go after problems like that that are in a closed world. But open-ended problems, like how do you understand the conversation that we're having right now, the current techniques don't really work. And I foresaw that, um, if that's the right word, in, in 2012. I said, this is not going to get us to natural language understanding or causal understanding. It's like one example we give in the book Rebooting AI is you can look at a grader, a cheese grader, and understand not just that it is a grader, which deep learning can do, it can learn to recognize it, but what the grader is for, why it has those funny holes and sharp edges, and why there's a handle on top. We still don't have a system that can look at an object and identify its causal properties and how you might use it and what it's for. We don't have anything like that. And seven years later, for all the talk, you know, AI is in the newspaper every day, and you have people like Henry Kissinger who want to talk about it in the head of Google. <laughs> Like AI is like all over the place. And, you know, Sundar talked about how it's like, you know, the biggest thing since fire and electricity. Like for all that excitement, we don't have um, a system that can understand what a grader is. We don't have a system that can read a children's story. So part of the point of writing the book was to actually go through these seemingly tedious, boring examples in enough detail that people would realize one thing, which is there's a mismatch between what we have now with deep learning, which is good at categorization, what we humans do, which includes categorization, but also includes a lot of reasoning and understanding and comprehension. So, you know, the key point of the book at some level is a mismatch. And, you know, you might say, well, why don't you just write another op-ed, Gary? And I do write more op-eds. But um, we felt we had to say this in a book so you could really see the texture, which means some people are going to say, God, what a boring book. This is just example after example. But we think that without the examples of going into depth, you can't see that there's this mismatch, right? There's a you know engineering term, an impedance mismatch. There's a mismatch between doing categorization, which is great for photo tagging and speech recognition, and doing the kind of connection between ideas that you do when you understand a story or a conversation. Yeah, and let me just say for the record here that your book has been endor endorsed not only by people such as Noam Chomsky, but also Steven Pinker, Gary Kasparov, uh, and many others. And modestly and humbly by by me too because i do agree with you too that... late to fit on the cover but anyway <laughs> sorry but you I, do agree that i i do agree that you know first of all the accomplishments of of ai have been greatly over exaggerated and overestimated in some sense and mostly due to kind of sensationalist titles that you see all over the place also the obstacles on the way towards real artificial intelligence or what we call often artificial general intelligence have been greatly underestimated and underrepresented um, and the challenges that we're facing there. So that's why I, I think that your book actually brings a very healthy dose of realism and goes deep into the nitty gritty of explaining why is it that we're having trouble getting there today and what needs to change if we want to get there. So uh, the reason why I like your book also is that even though some people call you a skeptic or a pessimist even, I disagree with them. I don't think you're a skeptic or a pessimist. I think 
think you're actually kind of an optimist, especially if you read the, the final ending of the book. All you're saying is that just the mechanisms, the instruments we're using right now are not working to get us there. You're not saying we can't get there or we won't get there. So I think it's a very good, very important book for that. Thank you. The, I mean, I think I, we are skeptics, Ernie Davis, my co-author, and I are certainly skeptics, but we are ultimately optimistic. We, we didn't write this book because we think AI is impossible. We wrote it because we think AI is important and we want to see it done right. So, you know, a phrase we have there is tough love. This book, this is a book of tough love for the field of AI. It's saying, you know, you're really excited about what you've done lately. You feel really self-satisfied, but there's some real problems that we still need to work on. And as much as possible, we're trying to diagnose them. It's not a book of solutions. Like it's a book of pointing towards solutions, but it's premature. We don't know the solutions. We don't want to pretend that we know the solutions. Um, but we think that we can diagnose specifically where the problems are, and we think that's an important step. I mean, our fantasy is that some grad student is going to read this book and actually figure it all out, and that would be amazing. Fantastic. Okay, so let's jump right in here, step by step, and get into the book. And, of course, we have to start with, with the title. You're calling it, first of all, Rebooting AI. So tell us exactly and specifically why is it that, in your opinion, AI needs to be rebooted? So, I mean, your listeners will all know the term reboot, right? That's starting over. Things have gotten corrupted. They're munged. You know, the memory um, has got messed up and your system is running slow or doing the wrong things. Um, we think AI needs that. <coughs> Not because we need to throw everything away, but because there's a kind of um, path that people have gotten stuck on. And it's in the long run, not a productive path. It actually is productive in the short run. So, you know, if you want to recommend advertising, you can use um, machine learning to see, you know, who clicked on what before. And it works great. Um, doesn't have to work perfectly. But the more that <coughs> we start to put our trust in AI by letting it make decisions about who we should hire or where the police should go or, you know, recognizing faces in airports and doing things like that. Um, the more that we're using AI in ways that have a effect, direct effect on people, um, the more it's important that it work well. And it doesn't work that well right now. It often works sort of 80% of the time. And you all know the 80-20 rule, but it's really dangerous in the context of AI. You don't want something to, you know, four out of five times recommend that you should, I don't know, bring this person in for police questioning. And the fifth time you bring in someone who doesn't belong there. I and mean, that'd be really a lousy record um, in, in that domain. An example we have in the book is if you build a elder care system and it lifts grandpa into bed 95 times out of 100, that sounds good, but wait a second. The other five times he dropped grandpa. I mean, you know, if that happens in my robot company, we're out of business. We can't afford that to have that happen. So there are some high precision jobs where the current techniques just don't work at all. And we're getting into this domain where people are trying to use techniques that are not appropriate for things like deciding whether or not somebody should get a job interview. Um, and the fact of the matter is that what we have right now are basically these giant correlation machines. If there's one thing I try to teach my students in intro psych, it's that correlation is not the same thing as causation. If you have a computer that calculates correlations, but has no clue about causation, why things are the way they are, it's a disaster. Like you give it some old set of data and you find that there's a strong correlation between having a penis and being a good musician. But it turns out that that's just old data, right? It turns out you don't need to have a penis to be a good musician. And it's just that for a long time, and society discriminated against people on that basis. And so if you just take your data at random off the web and you, you know, mix the old data with the new data, whatever, then you just perpetuate a bias um, that's already there. And this happens in all kinds of weird ways. Like if you do a Google search um, for mother and daughter or something like that, a Google image search, you probably get mostly white people. Does that mean that most mothers and their children are, are white people? No, it means that the data that Google Images happens to be sampling from is mostly you know, data of white people that happen to be labeled. And the systems have no depth there. They don't understand anything about sampling. They don't understand anything about stereotyping. And so people put Band-Aids on it. And they're like, you know, Google had, um, I might get this exactly backwards, pictures of gorillas that got labeled as African-Americans or the other way around. Um, and, you know, they fix that. You can fix a specific problem, but then there's a million other problems that are just like it. It's like playing a game of whack-a-mole. And if you don't have something with conceptual depth, it's going to stay a game of whack-a-mole. So, yeah, you fix this one particular problem. You, you watch out um, for the mislabeling of gorillas, but um, 
you don't have a general solution if all you're fundamentally doing is correlational analysis. Yeah, I think it was black people that was that were labeled as guerrillas. Uh, but of course, I may be wrong. Okay, so it, I mean, it's not that anybody at Google is, you know, sure prejudiced or something like that. None of this stuff happens deliberately. But if your samples are these kind of arbitrarily chosen samples, it, it's very similar to the problem where for a long time, all the data on heart disease was about men. Um, and nobody thought, hey, we should get some data on women. But you have all that random stuff in the world, and then you have these systems that are just dredging through all that data with no sense about what they're dredging, and it just makes it worse. Actually, a great engineering example of that that I recently discovered and had taken note and now use occasionally in my speaking is the you know the car crash tests. Turns out that you know the 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 uh, crash test dummy that was invented. 30 or 40 years ago, he has went through a few generations, but every single one of them is a guy, is a man. Mm -hmm. And with masculine attributes. And so when you test a car on a masculine crash test dummy, you're actually underrepresenting the damage potentially incurred by a female uh, body by 20 or maybe even 25% simply because the, the there were never female crash test dummies and we've designed the cars around those male crash test dummies and the female physique is completely different so you asked you know why I, or mentioned that i'm optimistic about ai in principle if we built ai the right way and there were causal models of human bodies and objects and physics and, and so forth eventually the ai systems will be able to do this themselves and they'll say did you mean to do an experiment that excludes half the population, or would you like me to fix that error? And right. like, I think this is possible. I don't think it's possible if all you do is a lot of big data in and you crank it with deep learning. But I do think we'll get to that point, it'll be great. Right. Okay, so let's talk about uh, your subtitle here. And, and I think you kind of touched on it, but I want you to unpack it even more for us. So building artificial intelligence we can trust. In a way, you're saying the the problem right now is that there's a lack of trust. Aren't you implying that? And why? It's actually even worse than that. Um, we talk about the three chasms in the beginning. One of them is the gullibility gap. And the real problem right now is that people are actually too trusting of AI. So the point of the book is we want to make AI that earns our trust. But right now we use AI that doesn't deserve our trust and we trust it. So you know, the classic example is Eliza. People started talking to this chatbot in 1965 and thought it was a person. And so they started telling its personal problems. And really, it was just doing basically keyword search. So you mention your mother, and it says, well, tell me more about your family. I have no idea what's actually going on. So people can be easily seduced into thinking machines are good. And part of the problem, actually, that we're, we're pushing against is people treat AI as if it's magic. They see a little bit of it, and they think it's as smart as a human. Because we're used to seeing humans getting quick evidence. That's a human. I can know something about it. We do the same thing with a machine, but the machine is not like a person. So you see your Tesla and you think it didn't have an accident in the first few hours. I guess it's okay. And the next thing you know, it drives into a tractor trailer taking a left turn or it drives into, um, you know, which has happened twice or it drives into a stop tow truck, which has happened at least once and stop emergency vehicles at least five times. So, you know, you get a <coughs> little bit of data and you're like, okay, I guess this thing's fine. It works like a person, but it doesn't work like a person. It's all of these rules and, and deep learning data combined in a system that does not actually understand the world. And so it can for a while look human, but it's not really like a human. It's not really better than a human. I mean, it might be better in Go, but in these open-ended problems like driving, it's not really better than a human, but people trust them quickly. So we have this terrible moment, I think, in the history of AI where AI is being given more power than it's ever been given before, but it doesn't actually deserve that power. And so like a ratio of power that we're giving it, like to drive cars, pretty serious power, or to <clears throat> direct a power grid, the ratio of that to the underlying depth of its comprehension is, is kind of frightening. And, and so, you know, we wrote the books, we want to change that. Yeah, and, and uh, I cannot think of a better example of, of over-trusting AI than the guy who was watching Harry Potter movie, you know, in his Tesla, while the car was driving him, and of course he crashed and he died. Uh, Chris Armson um, used to be at uh, Waymo, and he's recently started his own company, Aurora, you may know. Um, when he was still at Waymo, I saw him give a talk, 
And it was a reel of clips from Google engineers who had been told, you can go in this car, but don't trust it. Pay attention, keep your hands on the wheel. Like these are Google engineers. Like you have to be smart to be a Google engineer. You don't get there by, you know, drinking beer all day long, right? And the clips were all of them like reaching back for their briefcase and stuff like that. So these Google engineers just couldn't help themselves because they're human beings. They quickly attributed more trust to those machines than they should have. And nobody knew better than them, you know, that that was not, not a good idea. Yeah. And, and the extrapolation of that, unfortunately, that bugs me a lot is, uh, and and I, I'm I'm sorry to say this, but it happens very often to people in the singularitarian and AI communities who are very optimistic about the future. The 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 bottom line of that is people saying, "Well, we don't have to work to worry about uh, global warming or any of the grand challenges that humanity is facing today, because as soon as we get AI, it's going to solve all of our problems like a silver bullet or like magic." And you know, we are extrapolating to the point where. You know, oh, we don't have to stop doing the bad habits or the bad things we're doing, damaging self-destructive things that we're doing right now. Because you see, the moment we figure out AI, boom, our all of our problems are going to be solved. What do you think of that? I think there's a small chance that that will happen. Um, you know, there have been significant technologies that have had pro across the board effects. We don't have that now. So, you know, if somebody had said in <coughs> 1850, I kind of see how you could build a computer. You could build this automated machine that would do a lot of computation, take away a lot of drudgery, and that, that would really change our world. They would have been right. If they had said in 1850 that I think we'll have this in 20 years, they would have been wrong. And I mean, there is this history of AI and people saying, well, when do you think AI is going to be? And in 1950, they said 20 years. In 1960, they said 20 years. You know, uh, fast forward to now, and they're still saying 20 years. So people keep saying it's 20 years from now. At some point, it really will be 20 years away. I don't think we've actually reached that point. Um, we really will someday get AI that has the kind of <coughs> flexibility and creativity of human scientists and the raw compute power of you know, clusters that we see today. And that really will be transformational. We're not even close to it now. And the same goes for people's panic about AI. So you have some people that are like um, utopian, and you have some disutopians. And I think they're both imagining a kind of AI that doesn't exist anymore. We have a line in the book about, um, this is like being in the 14th century and worrying about, I forget what it was, you know, uh, internal combustion engines when they should have been worried in the 14th century about hygiene. What we should be worried about now is the AI that we have now. I mean, some fragment of society should think these, you know, deep thoughts about what's gonna happen in 100 years, but we have to be clear that those are thoughts about 100 years and not now. Um, so the dystopians are like, AI is gonna take over the world. And we have a riff in the book about what should you do if a robot comes um, to attack you, which we think is very, very unlikely. Um, and we say, number one, close the door. If that doesn't work, lock the door, right? <laughs> and since we wrote that, someone announced a data set, because that's what people do now. Everything's about a big data set. Actually, after you know the book went to press, somebody announced the, un, uh, uh, the opening door data set. And what's gonna happen is people are gonna come up with solutions where they can open like, 347 out of the 400 doors and they're going to pat themselves on the back that you know, they've got robots to do this and none of them will actually involve a lock, right? That'll be another data set that'll be like five years from now. And then none of those will involve the kind of lock where they didn't quite, you know, cut out the, the striker in the right way and you kind of kind of jiggle it. Like, you know, jiggling open a door is like, you know, where current robotics is, is like an eight or 10 year project. So like, you know, people are paranoid that robots are going to take all these jobs or that they're going to kill us. They show no interest in killing us whatsoever. I'll come back to that in one second. And in terms of taking our, our jobs, like they don't have the motor control, um, let alone the kind of feedback mechanisms to understand the world to do anything other than, let's say, pack iPhones in boxes because like every box is the same. Every phone is the same. But if you get out in the real world, like every doorknob is different. Everybody's got, you know, a different set of steps or whatever into their building. Robots are really not up to that yet. Um, there was something I said I would come back to, um, and I guess killing I'll... us all. The end. Of oh, the killing day. us all. So, like a lot of people on the opposite side of your utopians are worried about, you know, the mass slaughter of humans. Like there's the Nick Bostrom argument that, you know, somebody's gonna or <coughs> thought experiment. What if you made a robot that would make paper clips and it would make paper clips out of everything, including, um, you know, eventually us? It's possible. But the first thing to realize is that robots have shown no interest in being aggressive towards us. In 1970, 
AI systems could not play Go worth a hill of beans. Like a human that had played Go for a week could be um, a computer in 1970. And Go is interesting because it's a game of territory. That's the single thing that machines have done that is most like trying to take over the world. They tried to take over the Go board. So 1970, they couldn't do it at all. In 2019, they can beat the best humans that have ever played the game. Um, so there's exponential progress in the rating at the Go game. But they don't know anything beyond the board. They couldn't even play on a different board without retraining. Like if you made it a rectangular board, you'd have to start all over and play another 5 million games. And if you plotted the level of aggression in Go programs towards human beings from 1970 to now, it's a flat line. It was zero then, it's zero now. So like you're extrapolating wildly on something that has not actually happened at all. And then the other thing is if you actually taught machines common sense, which probably we'll talk about more in the interview, you know, if they had basic values like the asthma values, don't, you know, don't cause harm to people and some basic understanding of the consequence of their actions, which is probably re prerequisite to being as smart as the um, robots that Bostrom is talking about. I don't think any of this stuff really happens. So I, I don't want to say it's nonsense, but it's really, really improbable when you think through what AI would have to look like um, in order to get to those scenarios. So I don't think it's something we should be worried about all that much. Yeah, to be honest with you, that claim that, you know, the, the paperclip maximizing uh, AI or robot, to me, uh, doesn't work, at least it doesn't work in the level of artificial general intelligence, because in my opinion, that's an oxymoron. You cannot have an artificial general intelligence whose utility function would be to turn the universe or the known universe into paperclips. Like those two are incompatible. That goal function would not be simply the goal function of an artificial general Well, if you have a legally mandated module that demands that you figure out the consequences of your actions and that a legally mandated module that says that don't kill or you know minimize harm to people or something like that, then the system will reject the goal. Like, you know, um, we always have to worry, I think, about bad actors. So. Bad actors are already misusing AI, so they generate spam with it. They will probably eventually try to fool driverless cars and, and cause harm. And we have to keep worrying about that problem. We certainly should. The thing I don't think we should worry that much is about robots waking up one day and saying, you know, let's just get rid of all the people. I don't think that's possible. Yeah, but because the bad actors are all humans, actually. We are the ones who have the monopoly over both good and evil on our planet. And so if AI were to like wake up and start exterminating people, so-called AI, let's say warfare robots or reaper robots or, or predator drones start bombing us indiscriminately, it wouldn't be because it occurred to them suddenly and spontaneously, but it would be because some, some guy with an insidious agenda basically programmed it into them, right? Yeah. Which means the, the Lex Luthor uh, scenario is more plausible than the Terminator scenario. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I completely agree with you. Now, let's talk about the, the, the central problem here, however. So you're saying, or, or let's get the timeline first and then talk about the problem because you touched upon the timeline. So you mentioned that that kind of general intelligence that we're talking about the news and taking over the world or being smarter than humans equal or as of human value is not going to come here in a long time. And you even touched upon maybe a hundred years, you said maybe. So let me ask you straight up about Ray Kurzweil's timeline, because it's kind of the most popular timeline out there. And I don't think we discussed it in the first interview. Um, he says that by 2028, 29, we'll have a, a computer pass the Turing test, which means arguably, uh, or an alternative test, which would arguably say that it has equaled human intelligence. And then, of course, by 2045, we'll reach the singularity. So where about are you on that timeline? Well, I mean, first thing I would say is I don't think the Turing test is a great measure. Um, for the most part, although it was sort of well-intentioned, right, this is you fool the computer, you fool the person into thinking a computer is a person. Um, for the most part, it has turned out empirically to be an exercise in an evasion. So the way that you win in this game is you pretend to be a foreigner who doesn't speak English very well, a teenager who's not very responsive um, or sarcastic or things like that. And so you just kind of evade having to actually answer the question that would allow someone to, to you know, probe your knowledge and, and depth and so forth. So it's not an ideal yardstick, but let, let's not get too caught up in the specific 
test. I mean, the real question is like, are we on a path right now to get to human level intelligence in exactly. a decade? And I would say certainly not. Um, you know, one of the things we do actually in the book is we go through Kurzweil's latest innovation, which he talked about at TED last year, um, called Google Talk to Books. Um, so this is, you know, half halfway point, I guess. When, when, when did you place that bet? It was early 2000s, I guess. It's a little more than halfway. Um, and, you know, now we're 10 years away, so 2029. So what happens with the 2018 Google Talk to Books? He made a splashy TED Talk because um, in two minutes or, or well, 18 minutes, you, you can kind of pull the wool over people's eyes. But if you actually dig into it, well, um, you know, the headlines were this thing can read books and answer any question. But what it really did is it made what's called an embedding on your question. So it translated your question into a vector based on similarity of words and things like that. Um, and then it found passages in books that were similar. And so if your question is directly spelled out in the book, it looks kind of impressive. Um, it's also often impressive in a kind of weird, like, vaguely poetic way. So you ask a question, it doesn't really give you a straight answer. Um, if you ask it direct questions that have answers but that aren't spelled out on a page that require it to do just a little bit of reasoning, it's just terrible. People can go through um, the book to, to find some of the examples that we use. But it, it's awful. It, it doesn't actually understand anything that it's reading. And that is in no way, shape, or form 10 years away from being an artificial general intelligence. If you can't like combine three lines from three different Wikipedia entries um, in order to understand like what happened when and what context, then you're nowhere. Another example is GPT-2. Um, and I think I'll have a piece coming out in, in Wired about this soon. Um, GPT-2 is the most famous system right now for producing continuations to a text. So you feed in a story and it gives you something that happens next. And you know there was a big to-do about it, open AI, made this kind of song and dance about how they weren't going to release it because they thought it was so dangerous. It's not really dangerous. It's just something that makes up fake text. Um, I mean, you could argue it could be used for fake news, but I think humans can make fake news that's more compelling. I mean, there's some data we could argue there. Um, anyway, we fed stories into it, or we fed a story as an example. Um, a children's story that we go through in this book, you'll remember it's the Almanza story in the book. Um, yeah. Little boy loses his wallet, and or sorry, a, a, a finds older a gentleman wallet loses with his wallet. Fifteen hundred bucks. Say again. Finds a wallet with fifteen hundred dollars in it. See, you're a human. You understand. You can integrate the information. <laughs> so we fed it in, and it made a continuation. But the continuation is after the guy finds the wallet, finds all his money is still in it. Then it says he um, had the money in a safe place or whatever. Like it doesn't connect. The guy has actually had the money. Like, there's no common sense there. It does not understand what it's doing. It makes text that sounds fluent. Each word kind of is grammatically correct, but it is incoherent with respect to what's gone before. Now, we will eventually move past that point. But to say that we are going to move from essentially zero comprehension of written text to artificial general intelligence in a decade is unlikely. I will not say it's impossible, but <clears throat> you know, the root of being able to build an artificial general intelligence is it should be able to read things like Wikipedia and learn for itself. And I'm not talking about the stuff in the boxes where it says, you know, um, George Washington was born in this year and became president in that year. It's like very factual. Computers can deal with that. I'm talking about just people write paragraphs of text and you and I can read those paragraphs and understand what they're about, who they're referring to, what the relation is to the topic of the page. We have nothing like that. And we're going to have to have something like that before we can get machines to teach themselves. Alternatively, we're going to have to <coughs> figure out a way of representing in machine interpretable form all of the information in the world, and nobody has particularly done that either. So what we recommend in the book <coughs> is that you want to build a kind of bootstrapping system that understands some basics about space and time and um, causality and so forth, and then do your learning from there. But not enough people are working on that. Like They will eventually, and there are hints of it now, but maybe it'll take us 10 years to get that straight and another 10 years to apply it, and then maybe 30 years from now, um, which would be 2049, maybe you know there'll be some AGI then. We'll see little hints of it before then, but come on, right now, realistically, machines can't read. They, they are nowhere near to the comprehension level of my six and a half year old um, who was born just after we did that last interview. Mm -hmm. Nowhere near it. Yeah, and and uh, I'll get back to that and, and dig a little bit deeper there, but perhaps now is the time to share with us about the the paper that came out that made you the most angry 
uh, sen sensationalist paper that you've ever read in the last 15 years. Uh, and it was published the paper that made by, me most angry. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it was a, as a opposed paper, to the paper of mine that made other people angry. No, no, no. A too. paper that they, made they, you the most angry. It was published by Deep uh, Yeah, yeah, I know. Deep what Mind. The, the paper that really bugged me was a paper called Mastering Go Without Human Knowledge. And part of the reason it bugged me was it was published in Nature, which is supposed to be the most prestigious journal in the field. And I don't think it was carefully reviewed, and that's not a good thing. And nature is kind of across the street from DeepMind. And one wonders about, you know, the, the level of editorial review. But the, the real reason it bothers me is that it pushed the field in a, what I think is a bad direction. And it did that in virtue of misleading rhetoric. So the misleading rhetoric started with the title. The title said, Mastering Go Without Human Knowledge. Now, if I were the editor, the first thing I would have said is, is there really no human knowledge here? I'll just look at the list of authors first. One of them was a European Go champion. Like there was somebody on the team who knew a lot about Go. What were they doing on the team? Then it would have looked into the details and you would see um, that the system is very carefully constructed. We don't find out a lot in the paper about how it's constructed. But for example, there's lots of um, ResNet layers in particular places. There are convolutional layers in particular places. There are tricks with data augmentation that only make sense for Go. Like they rotate the board and make new data out of that. They flip the board. Well, that makes sense in Go. You couldn't flip the boards in the same way if you were playing chess. Um, <coughs> uh, maybe that's not a perfect example. You couldn't rotate the board um, in the same way if you were playing chess. Um, so they had stuff that was specific to the game. They had the rules that were built in. They did not stop to compare this with their um, Atari game system where the rules were not built in. So they, were, they had innately structured the rules into the system. So without human knowledge makes it sound like it was this grand demonstration of nurture in the old nature versus nurture side. But there was a whole lot of nature stuff in there. They also put in Monte Carlo tree search. That was invented by humans who were trying to figure out how to play Go. That's human knowledge that's in there. So it, it was really misleading. And then there was nothing in the paper about limits. And you know, I'm a scientist originally. And what you're supposed to do in a scientific paper is to say, we did this, we did that, but there are still these problems that are left to be solved. And what they did instead is they said, Go is one of the hardest problems in AI. And we've solved it and kind of invited inference that if we can solve this, we can solve everything. It didn't consider all the ways in which Go is different from other domains. So <clears throat> they didn't consider that you would need different knowledge if you were working on theory of mind. I wrote about all of this, by the way, in an archive paper called something like AlphaGo Innateness in AI, um, which people can find for free. Maybe you can link in the show notes. Um, so they had all of this knowledge built in. They didn't talk about the limits, how they need different knowledge in other domains. They didn't compare with their own systems that had done before. And so it was like a piece of PR to argue for an empiricist, which is a non-nativist view, when nothing is built in. So I didn't like the misleading nature and the direction that it was leading the field in, I think, is precisely the wrong direction. So there's a prejudice in machine learning, which they built on and made worse which is to not have any, anything built into the machines. They actually had some, didn't talk about it. They styled it as if there wasn't. It was a great triumph for not having stuff built in. And th there was progress there. Right? They didn't have to build in um, opening libraries, for example. Um, but they styled it as proof that you don't need anything built into machines. And I think that's where current AI is most deeply wrong, is machine learning has the upper hand right now, but people are forgetting that you need both learning and strong starting points. If you look at biology, that's certainly how it works. So look at the baby Ibex. Climbs down a mountain a few hours after it's born. It's a great BBC YouTube that, that people can find. The baby Ibex is a few hours old. It is not doing that with deep reinforcement learning, right? Deep reinforcement learning is what AlphaGo used to, to play Go. It played the game over and over again, millions of times, making lots of mistakes along the way. If a baby Ibex makes one serious mistake, it dies. It falls off of the mountain. So there was, you could call it learning, but I would call it evolution in advance um, that allows it to have a brain that understands a whole bunch of things. So it has to understand the three-dimensional world, has to understand geometry, objects, forces, its own body. Like there's a lot of stuff built into the baby Ibex. Humans look like they're pretty um, passive when they're born, but their brains are still wiring, right? Because the brain is too big to go through the vaginal canal, we come out before we're fully hatched. Doesn't mean that everything in the first three months of life is learned, which a lot of people naively assume. 
Um, <clears throat> there's still a lot, a lot of wiring going up for, I think, similar things like three-dimensional geometry, forces, understanding of objects, understanding of time and causality, and so forth. Um, by saying we can master something without human knowledge, you're like forcing a spotlight in the wrong direction. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. Uh, and that's why I was talking about some sensationalist titles. And this was one title that bugged me personally. And I've been actually trying to get Demis Hasabis and, and ask him about stuff like that, too. Because on the one hand, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that in 30 seconds. We, on the one hand, they, they did an amazing thing that no one thought could or would be done anytime soon. On the Which other I hand, gave them credit for at the beginning of this podcast, right? They have done amazing things, but they've also added an element of PR and in a disappointing direction. Right, exactly right. Okay, so, so, and, and by the way, you're not the only voice who is saying that people like Jaron Lanier uh, is also saying that, you know, claims that there's been no human knowledge in that are grossly over-exaggerated and underrepresent the, the thousands of engineers and programmers and other people who are actually absolutely vital to the success of Watson or DeepMind, AlphaGo, or you name it. Um, so, but let's talk about the accomplishment a little bit here because people would say, look, AlphaGo is three orders of magnitude more complicated than chess. Uh, therefore, uh, people or so-called experts who were talking about brute force computation because Deep Blue basically did brute force, right? Uh, it, it was calculating, I forget, 200 million uh, positions uh, at a time or something enormous like that. And people, based on that kind of projection, combined with the uh, current uh, hardware capacity at that time, were estimating that one probably will never be able to beat uh, Go, uh, uh, for machines to defeat humans in Go. And if that were to happen, it would take at least another 30 or 40 years into the future. And yet, we did that in like 2013 or something like that. Uh, so so the, the question then is, why is this not... Um, a benchmark on Ray Kurzweil's timeline towards human level AI and the singularity. Why is this great accomplishment that we never thought possible in this current time frame is not a sign that we're right there on the precipice? Because it's about narrow AI and AI in closed environments. Um, I alluded to this a little bit earlier. So, you know, the rules haven't changed. The, the things that you need to do are fixed. Um, one way to think about it, it's kind of crude, and I've never said this before, but it's sort of like saying that just because someone gets an 800 on their SAT math, they're competent to be really good at everything in the world. If you get an 800 on your SAT math, there's a lot of things you can do with that, but it doesn't mean that you're a particularly good reader. It doesn't mean that you necessarily have leadership skills and so forth. Actually, it it's doesn't mean anything because we have tons of research, in my opinion, or I believe that shows that there's no correlation between SAT scores and then performance later on in job positions and stuff. There, there's moderate. I mean, my read on that literature is there's moderate correlation, but um, they're not that strong. And um, I mean, even you know, SAT math versus SAT verbal are different and predict different parts of the variance, right? Um, so intelligence is a multidimensional variable. Um, in fact, the SAT math and SAT verbal is one piece of evidence for that. Right? The fact that they correlate modestly strongly, but they're independent, right? Um, so you know, Howard Gardner talked about multiple uh, kinds of intelligence, for example, you know, kinesthetic intelligence and um, musical intelligence and so forth. So one aspect of intelligence, which computers have always been very good at, is kind of sheer computation. And this is a new facet of that. And in a problem that is amenable to this kind of analysis of closed worlds, it's great. Um, and maybe there'll be some commercial application. There hasn't been a lot so far, um, but maybe there, there will be eventually. Um, but it doesn't equip you, for example, to read. And you could compare DeepMind's progress, <coughs> excuse me, you could compare DeepMind's progress on language with their progress on closed end games, and it's night and day. Right on closed end games, they've done great work. They apply the same techniques to language, and it's embarrassing. Like they're no nowhere near like what a three year old could do in reading. Um, I see, and even Demis Hasabis has gone on the record to actually admit, uh, I think maybe in the last couple of years or so, that 
the great hopes that uh, the 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 win at Go has provided them and that sort of momentum and and acquisition by Google and all that stuff happening has not actually translated into any measurable progress with respect to what we today would refer to as artificial general intelligence. I, I don't think it has. I mean, yeah. I, I think you know, Kurzweil talks about exponentials, and there's exponentials in these narrow domains: <coughs> Go, chess, and so forth. Um, you can actually plot them out if you have, you know, understand the rating systems involved. And then on artificial general intelligence, just basically zero progress. We don't have any system now, and we didn't in 1950 have any system that could, I don't know, like look at my kid's room, see that um, they built a train set and take it apart and, and put it away neatly, um, you know, stacking all of the light pieces or whatever. I mean, I just made up that example, but um, we don't have systems that you can kind of spell out in a sentence, say what you would tell a housekeeper and have them do that in an open-ended environment. Like that's just one example of artificial intelligence or of what a human with general intelligence does. Another example would be, you know, any of the million things that you could ask an undergrad intern to do for you. You know, if you're running a business and you had an intern come in, you could say, well, I want you to read these kind of reports, tabulate this and whatever. None of that can be done by current AI. There's not exponential progress on getting, you know, researchers that can uh, integrate information or on like, you know, you could also bring an undergrad intern into a car mechanic shop and you know, within a few days, they'd be useful. They might not be the best mechanic ever, but, you know, they would be able to take off the tires and they'd be able to understand a little bit about how the differential worked and all this kind of stuff. We don't have machines that can do that. We don't have exponential progress on that. We have zero. Right. And and by the way, just uh, to give you a couple of examples. Uh, so uh, when I interviewed Noam Chomsky and he basically said that we've made zero progress uh, on artificial general intelligence, people immediately jumped in and there's many comments on the YouTube video that, you know, who is Chomsky, that he's totally clueless. But of course, that that shows just people having no idea about Chomsky's work. Life I'll, I'll tell you his... a secret about Chomsky. Um, uh, I mean, he's 90 years old now and maybe a little bit slower than before, but not much. Um, he cultivates spies. I'm one of his spies. So, no, he doesn't read everything, but he talks to people like me. I send him my book. He read the book. He wrote, you know, he's 90. He was, it used to be when I would email him, he would either write back in 20 minutes or he'd apologize if it took him like two days. He was still the fastest person to write back. And what he would do when he found a new kind of intellectual correspondence, he would say, you know, do me a favor. Something interesting here happens. Let me know. So, you know. Noam Chomsky knows a lot, partly in virtue of the fact that he's created this amazing network of, of spies that are experts in particular fields and, and tell him what's going on and what something's changed. So I would never assume that Chomsky doesn't know what he's talking about. Once in a while, I think he makes mistakes. He's, you know, he's human, but sure. he he does keep his finger on the pulse by talking to other people that, you know. Sure, and he has founding contributions to at least two disciplines like linguistics and uh, cognitive science. Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, there's no question that... And they're both extremely of, relevant to AI. Oh, for sure. Like, I don't think he, you know, reads the literature daily in AI, um, but he has done foundational work that's important, some of which is really being ignored right now. So in particular, anybody that read Miller and Chomsky in 1963, um, on long distance dependencies and, and so forth. Um, and more fundamentally about the difference between statistics and what language is really about, would look at something like GP2, two, GPT-2 and say, you know, this is really cool, but there's some serious underlying problems here. Is this really how you wanna be spending your time? Like some of his ideas still matter. And the nativist ideas, I'm just, you know, channeling them towards AI, but they're his ideas more than anybody else except maybe Plato or Kant. Um, yeah, and then the other person, and I, I have many people who have actually concurred completely. The other person was the so-called father of AI, Dr. Marvin Minsky, who also uh, came out, uh, and I probably did the last interview that I'm aware of before he actually unfortunately died. But but over there, he, he also said kind of like you that the Turing test is a joke, but, but he also said that 
we have not made any progress whatsoever on artificial general intelligence. And not only that, but he thought that today there's much fewer people as a general number working on AGI than there were back in the day. And back in the day, there weren't too many people to begin with. And most people kind of dismiss that as the ramblings of, of an old guy who has failed to stay up to, in, uh, to date with the latest developments. But that, again, greatly underestimates how smart you know, Minsky was until the, the very last, because uh, I talked to him, he was very physically exhausted, but mentally, he was very sharp until the end. Um, so, well, and the other thing about the context there is, this is a man who made his name in a way being optimistic about AI. Um, and they were the words of a man who was acknowledging defeat in a certain way, right? It, it, it was he even said a lot interest. of very bad ideas became popular because I asked him, what's the problem? And he said a lot of very bad ideas. And I don't think he was excluding himself from that claim became popular when they shouldn't have been popular. That's what he said. Yeah, I mean, in this way, too, I, I see my work is echoing some strands of this, right? I mean, the, the book that Ernie and I wrote, Rebooting AI, um, is partly about a set of ideas that we think are popular partly for good reason, but partly with bad outcomes. So deep learning really is a useful tool and it's, you know, making a lot of money and that's, you know, reason for it to be popular and so forth. But it's not really getting us to the hard questions about artificial general intelligence. And so, you know, what's good in the short term, it's good for selling advertisements and it's good because there's enthusiasm and so forth, is not directed at, what we think are the hard questions about how do you get a system to reason in an incompletely understood world? So, you know, the other the problem with the approach that Minsky and folks took is they relied primarily on logic. They didn't know a lot about statistical reasoning, or at least hadn't thought to apply it in AI. Um, they also didn't have access to the data sets, the computation, the memory, such that they really could have leveraged it even if it was a priority for them. Um, and so in that time, they were probably doing it you know, they're doing everything with logic. And that's one form of reasoning. But the real world is full of cases where we don't have complete information, where things are partially understood or only partially perceived in a particular moment. Humans are very good at making inferences that it may not be logically perfect, but are pretty good relative to those facts. So I don't know everything that's going on in this environment, but I know a lot. I look, I see a couple clues, I make good guesses. That's a kind of reasoning from partial information that is absolutely essential if we're going to get to AI that can thrive in the real world in reliable ways. And nobody's working on that, or hardly anybody's working on it. More people working on that you know, 15 years ago than there are now. There are a few people that are working, but very few, I have to say, very few. Uh, and I, I have to say, I also like the quote that you bring on page 119, which is exactly here on topic by, of course, uh, Dr. Minsky again where he says that intelligence is not a single principle or a master algorithm, because many people are, are basically touting deep learning uh, and neural networks and, and, and all of that uh, as the master algorithm that you see brought us an incredible victory decades ahead of time in Go and therefore would take us to, you know, human level AI and the singularity. But but that single master algorithm is not going to be the case because as at least I agree with Minsky on, on the on the claim that you need a lot more things because our sort of mind is a society of mind. There's so many things that need to come together, right? Yeah, I mean you could um argue back and forth about his notion of society of mind, but I would start with a nature of what it is you need to do if you're an intelligence. And if you look at that, there's a lot of different strands to it. So one strand is you need to classify things. Does this belong to a category I've seen before? Oh, this looks like other shoes that I've seen before. It's probably a shoe. Actually, it, more, it looks more like a slipper. I've seen some slippers before. This is probably a slipper. So you do the categorization thing. That's part of intelligence. That's what deep learning is actually quite good at. There are other parts of intelligence that are like, you think about the function. So you look at a slipper, you're like, there's a space where my foot could go in between the top of the shoe and the bottom of the shoe. And I think, therefore, that it'll stay on. Or you see that the strap is broken and you say it probably won't stay on. Maybe I shouldn't use it or I should fix it. So you reason about what you see there. Deep learning <coughs> doesn't do that at all. Um, and so, you know, there are different things that are involved in intelligence. 
Um, there's, you know, reasoning about economics. I wonder how much I could sell this shoe for. Well, it's in bad shape. Maybe if I polish it, I could sell it for more. You know, there's the list of things that we do as intelligent agents is very long. Um, Minsky, you know, thought maybe there's like on the order of a hundred different agents. Maybe there's 20, but it's not one. And <clears throat> far too many people are looking for the one silver bullet. Like right now, well, a few years ago, it was deep learning. I think even the biggest fans of deep learning are realizing that it's greediness, it's requirement for massive amounts of data, um, and particularly labeled data is unrealistic. So now the silver bullet that people are questing for is what they call unsupervised learning. And, you know, they're still, they're looking for like one equation to rule them all, and it's not going to happen. And and just to support that, David Ferrucci, who I interviewed uh, a year or so after Watson's kind of legendary victory, kind of was on that same page together with Chomsky, together with Minsky, by saying that he honestly could not see how we would get there from where we were at that time. And I don't think he would change his mind uh, today. Uh, of course, I'm putting words in his mouth, but but based on that yeah, I've, I've spoken with him, I think that's fair. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so then let me, let me uh, uh, push forward maybe a little bit of an of a omission in your book that, that, that I think is important and, and you tell me if I missed it uh, or if you had a reason why it's missing in the book. And that's okay. a, a definition of AI. Because here's the thing, I've done like 240 of these with, you know, uh, Stuart Russell, who basically wrote the book on AI, and he told me, oh, the definition of AI has been basically the one in the book. That's what he told me. Many other AI experts have either a slightly different flavor of AI or a very fundamentally different definition of, of AI. So I, I don't think it actually admits of a simple uh, definition. So I would go back, first of all, to intelligence. Um, as to find of animals and people and so forth, forgetting <coughs> the artificial systems and say, as I've said before, that it's multidimensional. There are many things that go into it. And you can try to say, you know, intelligence is what agents do when they solve problems in flexible ways and so forth and distinguish that from, say, what a rock does, right? A rock is clearly not intelligent. Dr. Stephen Hawking, I think it was, who said intelligence is adapting to change or something like that. Yeah, I mean, you could start you know, wondering whether certain parts of geology adapt to change too, or whether species do, it's hard to pick it out perfectly. Um, and then you have to say, well, it's whatever that intelligence does um, if you do it by machines. And then what I would say is, there, because there's different facets to it, that we need to be careful. And fundamentally, in a way, the book is a campaign to say AI is not magic, and AI is not just one thing. It's, it, you know, people are looking for a homogenous thing, imagining if we have this thing in a bottle, we will solve all our problems. And the reality is there are different strands to it and some of them solve some of our problems. So if your problem is to recommend somebody a movie on Netflix based on what else they've watched, we have that solved pretty well right now. If your problem is to build a domestic robot like Rosie, they can understand your instructions and make sense of them and realize when you say, put, put everything in the living room in the closet, that you don't mean that you should put the couch in the closet. You just mean the, the other possessions, not the furniture. Um, we made no progress on that at all. We made no progress um, on the kind of general intelligence that allows you to solve all kinds of different problems. So AI is a very broad umbrella. Some things that go under that umbrella we're doing really well on, some we're not. And you can't just say, well, I have AI, therefore I can solve all these problems. You have to dig in and understand the different strands to realize what is feasible and what is not. And it's a broad enough term that it's not really going to solve the problem. Another way to put it is... So that's why you didn't put like a specific definition. That's why. I mean, in general, I'm kind of philosophically not that enthusiastic about definitions. I think there's often these kind of slippery slope cases and that getting into arguments about it doesn't really help that much. I can understand that a, a reader might be irritated that I didn't do it or we didn't do it. Um, but I think ultimately it is this very broad umbrella. And it'll be the same thing with intelligence. And people have a lot of trouble defining intelligence in human beings. That doesn't, by the way, stop them from doing good research on that. Um, and it doesn't stop AI researchers from <coughs> doing good research or bad research um, because they can't quite give an explicit term. So, like, for example, there's been great research on what's called SLAM, simultaneous location mapping. It allows a robot to 
look around its surroundings, track where it is, build maps and stuff like that. Um, I would say that's a form of intelligence, but that people working on Slam don't sit around, you know, wake up each morning and say, is this algorithm update that I'm doing, you know, will this system still count as intelligent? Like, that's just not part of what you do when you're actually doing the research. I mean, you're doing the research, you have a slice of intelligence that you're trying to build and you say, how do I get that to work? Is it working? What are the failure cases? How can I make it better or use less data or, you know, run faster and things like that? Um, workaday researchers don't worry too much about that exact definition of it. And I, I realize it's a little bit frustrating, but um, I sort of learned personally to live with that level of ambiguity and to try to look at it as, through the lens again of multidimensionality. There are many things that go into it. Because I, I a great uh, part of my audience are IT professionals and engineers. Uh, I also have a number of scientists and I respect their uh, decision or requirement for precision uh, and therefore uh, very clearly delineating and specifying uh, exactly what it is that you're referring to and what you mean. But But on the other hand, as a philosophy background myself, I can appreciate the fact that AI is as tricky to define as intelligence in general. But one thing is clear though is that, or at least I, I would agree with you on, is that as far as real intelligence is, so we have amazing accomplishments of AI in terms of, you know, navigation, in terms of like Watson and, and Deep uh, Mind and, and so on, AlphaGo. But as far as actual mimicking of real biological intelligence, like even like cats and dogs level, we are very far off from there and we haven't made much progress at all, you could argue, on that kind of level. Yeah, I mean, the motor, con the motor control involved in a cat is a nice example, right? I mean, a cat can like jump off a refrigerator that it's never been on before and land. Um, you know, the best kind of comparable demonstration I can think of is the backflip robot um, that Boston Dynamics did. Right. And that was, you know, off one particular table that had been marked out there were multiple takes in the video to make it work. Like, so that's motor intelligence. There's no robot that can match that. Robots can do individual impressive things, but a cat would be much more flexible in how it does what it does. Or take the, um, the kind of social intelligence that dogs do. So they understand eye contact and, and they understand where people are pointing and stuff like that. We're making some progress on that for robots, but no, there's no robot that can really make a human comfortable in the way that a dog can and interpret those gestures and so forth the way that a dog can. So you know, we're making a little bit of progress there. Um, the cat's motor control is a long way away. And you can go through different facets, but the fact is that, that you know, cats and dogs are still brighter than machines. And then you go to a six-year-old that can read, and then you know, the, the gulf between the machines and the people is just enormous. Okay, and, and one arguably one area where we have made not little bit but zero progress, perhaps arguably, uh, would be consciousness. And and you're a professor of, or at least professor emeritus of. Are you professor emeritus of psychology now, or? Technically, I think I'm just professor emeritus. The departments I were in were psychology and neuroscience. Right. So 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 you know about the importance of psychology, of course, but. In your opinion, so it's a two-part question. First of all, have we made any progress towards creating, forget about AI, artificial intelligence, but artificial consciousness? And then is that at all even necessary or required on the path towards artificial general intelligence? That's the second part. I would say that there's a tiny piece we have made progress on and that's important, um, which is a system has to have an awareness of how it fits into its surroundings. And you could say that's part of consciousness. There's another part of, and, and that's necessary, right? If you're gonna build a robot, it needs to know where it is and it needs to know the consequence of its actions. And so it has to have a model of itself. And depending on your views about consciousness, you could say that's either kind of central or you could say it's not really what I meant. So you know, there's another aspect of consciousness people call qualia and that's like, what does it feel like to see the color red or to have an orgasm? As far as I'm concerned, robots don't need to know what it feels like to have an orgasm, but they should know that people like them. They should have a theory of, of you know, what kinds of crazy things people will do um, that might cause them to lose their jobs or send them to jail because they like orgasms so much. So the machines have to understand the psychology of people. I don't think they personally have to have 
this kind of inner sense of this or that. It does mean that it's harder to program some of these things. So um, human beings can make good predictions <coughs> about other human beings by using themselves as an example. Like, I don't know you perfectly. This is, I think, only our third conversation. We met once in person, once, you know, doing an interview like this. So it's now our third conversation. But I can make pretty good guesses about things that you might do. Like, if there was suddenly a fire in the room, then as much as you are enjoying this conversation, <laughs> I'm going to guess that you would get out and abandon the conversation. And I am not going to then think he doesn't really like me after all, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to make guesses about why you did it, what your motivations are. And I'm going to do that partly based on my own internal sense. Like, you know, no offense to you, but if there's a fire here, I'm out of here. We'll finish <laughs> the conversation later. Doesn't mean I don't like you. You know, it's that, so I can reflect on all of that in order to make guesses about you. Poor robot is never going to be able to directly do that. You know, it might say my programming tells me, you know, in the event of fire to recalibrate my priorities. But it's just not the same as having an intuitive feel. And so that's going to make the whole thing of, understanding humans intentions and desires harder than it is for a human being it's a kind of handicap that that robots have to overcome that you could say is related to consciousness in the end we don't know a lot about consciousness and i always think of wittgenstein's line at the end of the tractatus which is whereof we cannot speak we must remain silent so i mostly don't talk much about consciousness i am very interested in questions like how do we give robots situational awareness the ability to anticipate the consequences of their actions in some sense, my new company, Robots.ai, is actually built around trying to think through those issues, trying to make tools so that if somebody wants to make a robot that works in the real world, it does have situational awareness and can act in sensible ways. Okay, and that's a fantastic segue to Robust AI. Tell us a little bit about when that started, who is involved, and what's the kind of uh, uh, mission, if you will. So the book actually, sorry, the company actually got started in a way as an outgrowth of the book. So Ernie Davis and I were writing this book and the, in a way the first central chapter was the reading chapter because we wanted to go through in detail like how different it is, I was talking about this mismatch earlier, how different it is between what robots, I mean what AI systems do and what you need to actually do in reading. And then we thought, let's have another example. What would be another good example where we could really illustrate the texture of the challenges and why the things that we're doing don't match the things that we need. Um, so we wrote this chapter on robots. And <clears throat> I, of course, um, had recently sold a company. I was thinking about what to do next. And somewhere you know, after we finished the first draft of the chapter, probably before we finished the chapter altogether, I, I realized that this is just such a fascinating problem, that the state of the art in robotics was very primitive, that it was a great place to actually explore artificial general intelligence. Um, you know, I'm not saying we're an AGI company, but I'm interested in making some progress towards AGI. And I think, you know, if you work in a domain like advertising, which would not be my personal taste anyway, but if you work in a domain like advertising, you don't really need to confront the kind of cognitive side of what needs to be done for general intelligence, because you can just do these kind of statistical approximations. Um, and, you know, I'm interested in how to make AI deeper. And robotics is a place where that could make an enormous difference, right? Right now, robotics is like a 25 or $50 billion a year industry, but it could be a trillion dollar industry um, if we could make the robots work in the real world. And that ranges from making robots that can actually deliver a package to your house, right? We have a bunch of robots now that are kind of in testing stage um, that will bring a kind of trolley on wheels to the front of your house. You have to come outside and get your package. Um, you know, if UPS said, Good news, everybody, we're reducing prices by 20%, but you have to come out to the street to pick up your packages. Most people would say no, right? Yeah. But that's sort of you know the state of that art. If you could make robots that could actually like come onto somebody's porch, go around the swinging chair, realize that they shouldn't run into the dog, that maybe they could ask the little child to move and, and so forth, the reason about the environment that it's going to deliver and actually bring it to your door, that'd be pretty great. Um, if you could, I mean, the thing we're most motivated by or excited by, even though it's maybe not short term, is elder care, right? We're going to a world where, you know, most of us are going to be older. There's not going to be a lot of people to take care of us. Um, and, you know, like a lot of people, like maybe they can hire an assistant for their parent for an hour a week. We'd lo love to have systems that were really there all the time to, to take care of our parents and ultimately ourselves. Um, you can't do that without the kind of stuff that we want to build. Um, construction sites are another example. Like, 
there are construction company robot companies that are building things like something that will excavate a specific coal. But wouldn't it be great if you had essentially an apprentice and you could say, <clears throat> you know what, here, I'm going to nail these first three, and then there's going to be 5,000 more. Can you do all of them the same for me? And have a robot understand what the same means and then have it execute on that would be amazing. And so like eventually these things will happen. The whole field of robotics will be a much larger industry. We want to build a platform that makes that possible. So uh, now that you're talking about robotics so much, uh, I can see how Rodney Brooks uh, has sort of come to work with you on, on robots. Yeah, so I mean, I worked hard to recruit him. I got him kind of in a lucky moment. So I sent him a draft of that chapter and something he, you know, he gave some comments on the chapter, most of which consisted of you're way too nice. The field of robotics is much worse than, um, you know, <laughs> we were already critical. And he's like, no, you should be much more critical. Um, so he gave a bunch of comments like that, but something in what he said made it sense. I had the sense that he might be free sometime soon. Um, uh, I thought maybe he was tired of his existing company. Turns out ultimately they went out of business. And there's a story that I'm not um, going to tell about that. Um, but so he was suddenly free. I, I kind of, you know, I wrote back and said, well, if you are free, boy, would I love to have you involved in this company. This is what I'm thinking about. And he, first he was really excited. And then he was like, what am I crazy to get involved in another company? I want a break. And, you know, he, he talked things over with his daughter and blah, 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 blah. And it took a little while um, to recruit him, but we really share a sense of what the field needs to do, what would count as important progress. And also a sense that we don't want to do something that isn't important progress. He had a line about, you know, if I wanted to build a window washing robot, I could do that, but this is not interesting. Like, he could totally do that. He'd be the best person in the world to build, you know, a practical, economical window washing robot, but it wouldn't be interesting. His phrase is he wants to do something iconic. And so do I. We've both made enough money that you know, it's not like, you know, I, I can't pay my kids way through college and, you know, his, his kids are fine. And, um, so we want to make money. We enjoy making money, but um, you know, we both really want to do something significant and see the same thing that could be significant. So, you know, we batted ideas around about how exactly to formulate the company, but eventually um, I was able to recruit him. And that itself is, you know, a major feat because then it's opened up many other doors. So now, you know, we have this awesome team um, that we've built over the last couple of months. That, like almost everybody that we've made an offer to has said yes. And, you know, having his name and my name has meant that we get lots of funding. And, you know, it's been great. That, and, and the other sort of very notable individual there in, in, on your team is Professor Steven Pinker, of course. Tell me a but little bit. He's an advisor. Oh, I mean, our advisor. advisor list is also uh, amazing. Um, but you know, we, we want to build cognition. And who has thought more deeply about cognition than Steven Pinker? Mm -hmm. Excellent. So, I mean, we, we have a lot of, I think, you know, fantastic people, um, both on the team itself and in the advisory ranks. Um, people can, can see the list at robust.ai. It's, it's you know, it, it's an all-star team. It's great. Very cool, very cool. Uh, I wish you good luck with that. Uh, let's we're we're kind of sort of in the last maybe fifteen minutes or so here of our interview. So let's kind of move on to 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 the epilogue of your book here, if you will. Now, so you write this whole book and you talk about the AI chasm and and some of the problems with the current sort of focus of research and funding in AI and all kinds of things like that. And, and that's all good and great. And and you're talking about how we're sort of in the need of rebooting it. But yet you kind of come up with an epilogue which is highly optimistic. So to me, there was like a bit of a disconnect, sort of uh, a bit of a jump, if you will. Uh, well, so and, the, 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 the premise of the book, in some sense, is that we need a reboot, that common sense is critical to that, what we call deep understanding as opposed to just deep learning. Um, and we're not there yet, right? I mean, the field is, doesn't know how to build common sense into machines, doesn't know how to build deep understanding. We try to give some clues about how we could get there. And then the last chapter is what would happen if we actually got there? And we're actually pretty upbeat about that. We think that if machines could understand the world around them, could read and so forth, they really would be transformational. But, but why? Because here you say on page two, two, uh, 205, None of this will come soon or easily, and I agree with, with you on, on the easily part, especially on the soon. I am not an expert, so I really am totally clueless as for when it could come or not. Everybody but, can at least agree it's not going to be easy. 
But I 100% say that it's going to be much harder than we've portrayed it to be so far. But then you say, because AI is so hard, but it will come eventually. So why not say, well, maybe we are just not smart enough to create artificial intelligence. Uh, Werner Vinge, for example, specify certain conditions under which the singularity would not come. And he has three options, I think, if I remember. So why are you so upbeat that it will, despite the hardship and, and the wrong direction we're in right now, we're still going to get there? Why so I mean, I'm, I'm so optimistic because the brain is a physical organ. The human brain is a physical organ. And it's an example, an existence proof that general intelligence is possible. It's not perfect. They wrote a whole book about the foibles of the human brain called Kluge. Um, and I, you know, I still stand by what I wrote there. There are lots of ways in which the human mind could be even better than it is. And I think, you know, the ultimate AI will combine the best of the kind of computational power of machines with the flexibility of human minds and, and dispense with some of the foibles. So like humans are subject to confirmation bias, right? We notice evidence for our theories and not against, and there's no reason that our AIs need to be built in that fashion. Our memories are lousy. There's no reason that AIs need to have that. So the ultimate systems aren't going to be copies of us, of us, but the fact that a brain, a human brain can be as flexible as it is. You can take a child and they can grow up to do essentially anything with the right kind of education, um, maybe in the right set of genes. Um, but, you know, a bright child can do almost anything imaginable. And they do it with, you know, a physical device in their head. And there's no principled argument that says we can't build machines that do similar things. Like, we may get there <coughs> by reverse engineering the brain. We might do what I suggest, which is more like reverse engineering psychology and linguistics and so forth. We might get there just ent entirely other ways. But I don't see an argument that says we can't get there. Um, <coughs> there's also like sometimes people argue we can't get to consciousness because we can't understand it. I, I don't generally understand those arguments. They're not very sympathetic. And I think a lot of them just show a kind of um, an error of, of being stuck in the present. So we notice we don't say this is going to happen in 10 years. And, you know, it might happen in 10 centuries. I think it will happen sooner than that. But what's your like, best guesstimate? My best guesstimate is 30 to 50 years. But, I, you know, I, I don't want to put a lot of money on the specific number. Um, I put some money on it not being 10 years, being longer than that. Um, and I don't think it needs to be many centuries. I mean, we do have some tools in place to work with. Um, so. There are parts of the puzzle that we have solved. And if we reorient, I think we can do a good job. So I, I think that, that we will come to richer forms of machine intelligence, that they'll be very helpful. And the, the last chapter is trying to lay out some of the ways in which we think that's possible. Very interesting, Gary. So for those of us who may want to find more about you and your work, I know that you just moved from the East Coast to the West Coast and all that stuff. What's the best place to kind of connect with you or follow up on updates and whether on your work as a personally or on robust AI and so on? Um, well, there's three websites, I guess I can tell you. Um, or Sorry, two, two, two web, three, no, three. There's GaryMarcus.com. There's Rebooting.ai, which is the book. Robust.ai for news about the company. Um, and then there's my Twitter feed, which I'm, I'm fairly active on which is at Gary Marcus. Excellent. So Gary, we spoke today for, I think, about an hour and 20 minutes so far. And we covered why uh, we are in desperate need of rebooting AI and sort of the, the problems the, of the current, you know, state of school, if you will. Uh, and yet we remain optimistic at the end of this conversation. But if there was a single message or perhaps the most important thing that you would like our viewers and listeners to take away from you today, what would you like that to be? That it's really, really important that we build AI that we can trust, that we haven't done that yet. And therefore, we need to think seriously about how we might get there. It's really important to build an AI that we can trust. Let me just ask you to unpack perhaps a little bit more the trust, the word trust here. What what trust is in trust the for you? That, well, look, we used to live in a world where there was no AI. There was no AI to trust. 
But now <clears throat> we live in a world where AI is ubiquitous. Um, and as it is ubiquitous, um, we're laying more and more responsibility on it. You don't want to put responsibility on a person that you don't trust. You shouldn't want to put responsibility on a machine that you can't really trust. So, you know, one example is a driverless car. You know, if you give that car responsibility for your life and the life of other people, you should trust that it's going to do, you know, at least as good a job as a human being. And you don't want it to do really weird things that you don't understand. Um, and you don't want it to do really bad things. So, you know, crashing into stop vehicles on highways, for example, is a bad thing. Um, crashing into tractor trailers, decapitating the driver is the worst thing. Um, and yet Teslas have done that. Um, that's an example where um, people quickly come to trust a particular piece of AI, the so-called autopilot, which is not really that and should not be deemed that. Um, you know, people come to trust it because it works in some situations. And if you're naive about AI, you think if this AI works, it just works. And part of the point of the book is just because something works in some context doesn't mean it works in all contexts. You know, it works on sunny days. It doesn't guarantee it's going to work in the rain, right? <clears throat> it turns out the properties of the sensor systems are very different. The perceptual systems are trained on examples where there isn't so much rain and you can try to work with that and so forth. But um, th there's an old... Uh, term that rhetoricians use, which is called the fallacy of the composition, which is to believe that if something works in one circumstance, it's going to work everywhere. And the lesson of AI so far is it's not really true. Um, you know, another example we didn't talk about, but this is in the book, is DeepMind had this Atari game system, and they trained it on breakout. It seemed to be great. Then you move the paddle three pixels and it falls apart. Like, you can't trust a system that is so brittle that it can't deal with slightly different um, you know, consequence, uh, so, uh, slightly different environments um, without kind of melting. And that's what trust is about, is that if I say, go learn how to play Breakout, you're going to be able to play Breakout, even if it's a little bit different. Yeah, and I think it's important here to just perhaps expand also a little bit more on self-driving cars, because there's a lot of people out there who I think have the perception that AI is basically self-driving cars, and that, as Elon Musk said it, uh, we should be having them very, very, very soon here. Uh, and of course, and so I just want to ask you quickly to talk about the timeline that you see on self-driving cars, because for me, my, my personal test is like, not whether uh, we can self-drive, so-called so self-drive a car on the highway here in, in Canada or in the US, but let that car go to like India uh, where there's no, uh, you know, tra traffic signs and, and lanes even and, and rules or like, it's it's like kind of like free for all and let that car drive there. And once it can do that, then I'll say we have a self-driving car. So <laughs> I mean, you, you made exactly the right point there, which, which is that, again, the context matters and the generalizability, which is what we haven't used today, matters. Do you have a self-driving car that has a solution that generalizes to different contexts. So we will see self-driving cars roll out in the next few years, but they will work in very limited routes where like there are no left turns to do. And the amount of pedestrian traffic is very low and the weather is good and, and so forth. And we might see that in three or four years or something like that. But those solutions that are rolled out initially are not gonna work in you know Bombay or Mumbai. Um, they, they're just, not going to be reliable enough. The first ones are barely going to work in the cities that they're in, in places where there are left turns. You know, so the initial, like everybody like in that field wants to say, we're first. And then you, you know, you read the fine print and it's like, Andrew Ng was like, we have the first, you know, rollout in Texas or whatever. And then he read the fine print of this company of, the, of his wife's that he was on, that has since bought, um, bought up by Apple, but probably not for a lot of money. Um, like they claimed to have this big rollout and then it really consisted of going like five blocks on a single route over and over again with, I think no left turns. Like it was kind of, and it was in Texas, like, it was, you know, not a lot of snow there. Um, probably none. Right. It, it was, they were like, we have the first self-driving cars, but you read the fine print and it's not like that. I had a tweet a couple of months ago um, where there was a story in the verge that said, I forget which company had a rollout of, of, uh, self-driverless cars 
And I said it was kind of like a IQ test or something like that. See how fast you could figure out that the headline was misleading. And the reason the headline was misleading is I think it didn't it was mention. I might have been Waymo. I'm not sure. In but Scottsdale really, or something like that in Arizona. It might have been Waymo in Scottsdale. I don't remember. But the headline said driverless cars. Oh, you read five paragraphs in and it says there are safety drivers. Wait a minute. If it's a driverless car, there, I mean, it's a real driverless car that's on the road. That means there is no safety driver. Right, but nobody knows how to actually build a driverless car yet where you could trust it to come back to this word enough so that you would not need a safety driver there. So what we have now are cars with nobody in the driver's seat. We need a new term for it. Um, you know, empty driver seat cars where there are safety drivers and they're, you know, limited domains. That's not a, a driving agent, to use a word that Minsky likes. Um, it's not an agent for driving that you can trust. It's an agent for driving that you, you find, you know, a toy version of your problem on to show off. So when do you think we might be able to get the car that's driverless car in Mumbai? 20 years. I mean, it's partly a function of like how much money people invested in. And it's partly a function of developing other techniques that we don't really have yet for dealing <laughs> with the outlier cases that even when you collect them at an driving amount, there is a bunch of outlier cases came together <laughs> like basically they're all outlier cases yeah there, because um, there's no standard that's enforced right yeah i mean there are some things that happen a lot for which you can collect that might not be legal but you can collect a lot of data statistics for. So, yeah like, um you can get statistics on merging and stuff like that the merging is not one of the strong points of current um, AI either, but like, you know, you go to a rotary and I get, I've never been to Mumbai, right? I would imagine you go to a rotary, um, or Mumbai, you, you go to a rotary there. And, um, if it's like the ones that I went to in Tijuana, um, a number of years ago, like it, it's what you kind of described as a, as a <coughs> free for all. And so it's not this neat thing of people kind of alternating terms, uh, uh turns and there's, you know, clear rules of right away and so forth. You can collect a lot of data on that. It might help. What you're going to get are statistical distributions. Deep learning is not actually great at the particular kind of distribution because you don't want the best answer. You really want to know the range of answers so you can compensate. But there are techniques that you know people could use to deal with that. Um, so you'll be able to deal with some of that. But then you'll find like somebody's walking across the street on an animal, and all you you, know, you don't have any of that data in Menlo Park where people are doing most of the research, and then. You know, here's somebody in India or dragging their animal across the street. And like, it'll turn out that with respect to your data set, that's just not in there. And the system will be able to cope with it. Whereas a human being could say, okay, I see what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Well, going back to your major point that it's really, really important to get AI that we can trust. I would say particularly when it comes to humanity's greatest grand challenges, like, for example, climate change, because... We are putting, actually, as you said, so much trust in AI to drive a car, but there's others, as I said in the beginning, who are putting so much trust in, in AI to solve our problems. So if we can't trust it and we give it not a, a driving task, but a task to save the earth from global warming, and if we can't trust it at the same time, that's a real big issue. So I completely agree with you that we, it's very important to build an AI that we can trust. We'll come back in another seven years and see how much progress there's been. If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes or you can simply make a donation. 